and welcome to today's lecture, South and Southeast Asia after 1200. Today we're going to be looking at the influence of Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and also Europe, European influences here in this region of the world. We're going to be looking at the influences of Islam from the Sultanate in uh, Delhi. We're going to also learn about the Mughal miniature paintings and illuminated manuscript painting uh, that is so famous for, for this region. We're going to be looking at the Taj Mahal in uh, Agra. We're going to be looking at the uh, European, pr primarily the British influence in um, Bombay or Mumbai. Uh, we're going to be looking at the uh, Hindu temples in uh, Myanmar and Burma. And we're going to be exploring a lot of different art and architecture. Um, definitely, I mentioned that we're going to be focusing on the Persian influences with the Mughal Empire. We're going to be um, wanting to understand the art and architecture of the indigenous Rajput kingdoms in contrast with the Mughal influenced art. We're going to be examining Western artistic influences and Southeast Asian adaptations of these Western artistic mediums and concepts, especially by the time we get to the modern era. And we're going to be looking at different artistic differences in Southeast Asia as well by the end of the chapter. This is the Kutub Minar. Uh, it was begun in the 13th century in and around the late medieval time period in Delhi. And the Sultanate of Delhi was established in the year 1206. And then the city's first mosque was built. This mosque marks the triumph of Islam in Northern India. The Kutub Minar boasts the world's tallest minaret. Of course, the minarets were used to call Muslims to prayer. They're tall towers that are usually um, associated with uh, a mosque and prayer. At 238 feet tall, it's pretty much too tall to, to even function now at this point. <laughs> the Lotus Mahal, uh, this one is in India, 15th or maybe 16th century. Uh, in South Asia, the Hindu kings were uh, ruling um, the building blended the pyramidal vimanas. These are the Hindu t uh, tiered towers. And it's blended with Islamic architecture. Here we can see those multi-lobed arches that are so unique to the Islamic architecture that we had been looking at um, in previous chapters. So let's take a look at one of the most famous of the Mughal um, uh, uh, architectural uh, masterpieces and we're going to look at the Taj Mahal of course the um, Taj means crown and the Taj Mahal was built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his third wife Mumtaz Mahal and it stands as a symbol of eternal love the building took 20 years to complete and was constructed from white marble underlaid with brick. Taking a look at some more of the uh, uh, shots from around the uh, uh, reflecting holes in the grounds of the Taj Mahal, we'll also take a look at some of the architectural details in a few slides here in just a second. Um, the exterior with the garden, here we can see that the mausoleum seems to float magically over the reflecting pools in a vast garden. We know how important those reflecting pools were to Islamic architecture. Um, the two may have been conceived as the throne of God perched above the gardens of paradise on Judgment Day. The crown of the dome here with the finial. Um, the main finial was originally made of gold, but it was replaced by a copy made of the gilded bronze later in the 19th century. This finial is topped by a moon, a typical Islamic motif. The points are directed upward toward the heavens. It also gives you a bit of the detail, too, of the uh, tricolor marble inlays. And looking here at the tomb entrance of the, uh, the entrance portal, we can see that there are some floral inlays. 
with some have precious uh, and precious stones that are inlaid directly into the white marble. This Pietra Dura stonework enhances the impression that the huge structure is actually weightless. So we're getting this um, feeling of the ethereal, the weightless, the timeless, um, which is so fascinating because of course it's a very, very solid uh, work of art. Inside, if you look up at the interior of that dome, you would see elaborate geometry and uh, designs that really are incorporating, of course, um, lots of Islamic motifs, but as well as a Byzantine influence from the Christian world. And we also see influences with um, Hinduism uh, and also Buddhism uh, here as well. With the exterior, definitely we see the Persian calligraphy, um, some examples here on the vertical um, push tack uh, with the um, uh, inscriptions with the calligraphy kind of merging with the architecture. So I mentioned that the Taj Mahal is uh, a mausoleum. So it houses the uh, physical remains of Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal. Um, so we have, you know, funerary art here in, in the form of um, a beautiful building from the Mughal period. And then this last detail, I think, really showcases the um, refinement and the, um, you know, attention to the, um, you know, the brilliance of, you know, the observation of nature, how the natural component is really embedded into the architecture here. From the tomb platform, this is showcasing the carved marble flower uh, motifs. We can see the Islamic, Hindu, and Byzantine elements are fusing together here. The Indian Mughal Empire is really best known for its Mughal miniature paintings. So we're going to look at the Persian uh, influence with the Mughal painting and the tradition of these miniatures and look at um, some of the specific artists related to this uh, technique. So first of all, we want to understand the technique, the process, some of the tools that are used in creating these, and then give a few examples of specific you know, works of art uh, related to miniature paint. So here we have the lead tetroxide, it's also called red lead or the uh, miniatum, and it's a pigment that was used in Mughal and Persian miniature paintings. And that term miniatum, that's actually where the idea of miniature derived its name. Um, the miniatum was something, of course, it's a beautiful red pigment, the red lead pigment, that um, the uh, scribes, the artists, the uh, manuscript artists, would transfer over their designs onto the pages and they would poke holes in through the design, the paper of the design, and then pounce over the red lead, the miniatum, over onto the, um, the animal skin, you know, the parchment or the vellum that they were going to be painting on or even gilding. Um, so very, very detailed and very exact once they had that final design planned out. Um, so the miniatum was so, so crucial because it really was the framework uh, underpinning the entire painting. Um, uh, most of these miniature paintings you'll see are going to be using watercolor or sometimes um, gouache. The binder in watercolor is gum arabic and gum arabic is uh, made from the uh, sap or the resin of the acacia tree, so the acacia gum. It uses the binder, and after the water evaporates, the acacia gum in the paint film increases its luminosity and helps prevent the colors from lightening. The acacia gum allows more precise control over the washes because it prevents them from flowing or bleeding beyond the brush stroke. Really important, especially if you're working with the, uh, the miniature manuscript painting. In addition, acacia gum slows evaporation of the water giving a slightly longer working time, which is obviously beneficial to any painter. 
Some of the tools of a calligrapher, if they're working on illuminated manuscript that also has uh, pages with text, as well as the full page illuminations, the tools of the calligrapher would be things like the knife for cutting and um, sharpening the pens, scissors, your ink well uh, for the iron bowl ink, the pen box, the pen rest, and the sand shaker. Uh, this is a photo that I took from the British Museum in London. It just gives you a really good idea of all of the different um, specific tools needed when it comes to the art of calligraphy and manuscript making. All right, so here we have the designer Baswan and the colorist Shatar Muni. So this was a collaboration. Uh, this is one page from Folio 22 from the Akbar Nama, the history of Akbar. And we see that the Emperor Akbar uh, is seen here um, controlling the elephant Hawaii. So we see that Akbar is trying to get control over this chaotic uh, elephant who's gone on this rampage and his uh, ability to control the elephant right here at kind of the apex of apex of all the chaos is an allegory or a symbol of his ability to rule his kingdom so here you can see the elephants are so heavy and so rambunctious that they're really sinking the boats here at this port and you can see the waves kind of emanating and sort of throwing people overboard and the boats are all capsizing. Um, there's just so much vitality and uh, energy and movement, but um, you know, you can see some stylistic conventions that are being used by the artists here, but overall just a wonderful sense of luminosity of the color and repetition and, and uh, rhythmic lines and diagonal lines that really zigzag through the space that give that sense of that um, drama in this particular moment. All right, uh, here. Uh, this is uh, from the, um, the uh, uh, manuscripts that were commissioned by Jahangir, the Emperor Jahangir. And I know that it's important to talk about the stylistic influences that are portrayed within this work. We want to make sure we know how and why that is. So the title of the piece is Jahangir preferring a Sufi Shaikh to the Kings. So of course we see an influence of um, European painting styles as well as the Persian miniature styles all here with the Mughal miniature painting is a great example to use uh, if you're wanting to showcase that. Jahangir sits upon the hourglass throne that is um, symbolic of time. So he really is seated above time itself. Um, the radiant halo of the sun and the moon behind his head indicates that he is the center of the universe. The cosmos literally revolves around him. So that really speaks to his ego. And down below uh, on the hourglass, hourglass throne here, we see the two cupids, which um, really kind of are coming out of a European Christian tradition. Um, we see two cupids, or even, you know, Greco-Roman world, cupids, angels, uh, inscribing his name onto a th the throne itself. Um, and they're mentioning that he's going to live for, you know, a thousand years. And uh, on the bottom left-hand corner, we have the actual artist, Vishtir, uh, who has signed his name, and he's also inserted right, a self-portrait of himself, the artist here, holding an illuminated uh, uh, portrait of uh, horses and elephants, and this is um, a gift that he's you know, offering to the king. And above him, we have other kings. We actually have, um, the king of England. Um, so we have European kings in the scene, right, with the artist and so on. And the Emperor Jahangir is preferring the Sufi uh, Shaikh, who is a mystical saint. He is preferring the saint to the, the other kings of the other, of the other um, countries of the world. So he is preferring the spiritual world over the worldly um, power. 
And it is fascinating because, you know, we do see this influence of realism. The artist has actually painted the King of England in this three-quarter view. He's painted him sort of more in the European tradition. It is likely that the King of England had sent a portrait to Jahangir um, as a political gift. And that artist was able to look at that painting, you know, the oil painting, study it, uh, understand the technique, you know, but this artist is working in this, um, you know, Mughal uh, tradition. We have the strict profiles, lots of affinity for detail. Um, so it is kind of cool to see the fusion here between these worlds. Um, John Jir was really interested in science and um, the world around him. Um, he uh, was interested in the idea of mimicking nature and, um, you know, bringing to the forefront um, observation and, um, and, and knowledge uh, during his court. So we see him commissioning a lot of uh, scribes and scholars to work on documenting um, the natural world, the animals and the uh, botanical plants. Um, here we see that painters were documenting animals and plants um, that they would have either encountered um, on these military expeditions or uh, animals or plants that they would have received as donations from his uh, friends from other countries. Jahangir maintained a huge aviary with birds and also a large zoo, kept a record of every specimen and organized these various experiments. So here we see zebras from Africa there in the Asian continent being studied and explored. Um, here we have some more examples of animals, you know, from all over. Here we have Shah Jahan on the globe. This one is a watercolor on paper. So the successor to Jahangir reigned during the golden age of the Mughal Empire. Shah Jahan is standing on the globe of the earth. We can see cherub, you know, winged angels above him. He has the radiant halo of light um, emanating from his head, sort of signifying that he is larger than life, that he has a kind of a divine reference. He has the, you know, divine right to rule his empire. Now, I love this one, Shah Jahan on the peacock throne. This is an opaque watercolor on paper. We see also, again, that, that strict profile format. Um, but really what, what really bedazzles us with this particular painting is the actual detail in the illumination of the peacock throne itself. The peacock throne is the name of the throne of the Mughal emperor. It's inlaid with sapphires, rubies, emeralds, pearls, and other precious stones of appropriate colors that represent life. Shah Jahan had the famous Kuni Noor diamond placed in this throne. It is the diamond that, you know, after it's cut, it's a 105 carat diamond. Well, in 1850, the diamond was confiscated from the Sikh Empire by British East India Company and became part of the British crown jewels when Queen Victoria was proclaimed the Empress of India in 1877. And although much later, India earned its independence from Great Britain, they still have not been able to get back their Kuni or diamond. It is still a part of the British crown jewels today. If you visit England, you would be able to see it. And in 1850, the diamond was confiscated. So there it is. All right, the Hindu Rajput kingdoms and the Nayak dynasty. This is one or two good examples in here from um, the tradition of the Rajput painting and how it could differ from the Mughal paintings that we were just looking at. Um, we want to understand the Hindu subject matter of the Rajput um, uh, kingdoms. So here we have um, a love story, the love story of Krishna, the blue god, uh, seen uh, here with a Radha in a pavilion. Um, the subject is um, colorful and sensuous. Um, this is just one example of the um, love of Krishna and Radha 
Um, this one takes place uh, inside of a uh, lovely architectural pavilion that's been inlaid with some of precious stone. Um, there are others that I've seen uh, where they're surrounded by fruit trees and there's lightning flashing in the sky. It's, you know, just really all about their um, intense love and their devotion. So Krishna's love was a model of the devotion paid to the Hindu god Vishnu. And Krishna is one of the avatars of Vishnu. Now, last class we were learning about Hinduism and the avatars um, of Vishnu. We looked at examples of the boar avatar of Vishnu, um, you know, rescuing the world here. This is Vishnu, you know, representing ideal love in this world of Krishna. Um, so Lord Vishnu came to restore the Dharma. This is the natural law of all things to the earth in a time when it was greatly imbalanced. So love was definitely needed in that time. Um, the Mughal emperors ruled, but much of the Northwest India had remained under the control of the Hindu Rajput, who commissioned this piece here. And they will eventually submit to the Mughal emperors. Um, but this is an excellent, um, quite colorful uh, narrative example of their miniature painting. All right, the architecture of the Nayak dynasty. So let's look at some of the Hindu influence here with the Gopuras of the great temple in Madurai, India. Uh, these were completed in the 17th century. And the Gopuras are um, important to Hindu architecture. They are the gateway towers that are decorated with sculptures. Um, the tallest is dedicated to the Hindu god Shiva the uh, destroyer of the universe. Every 12 years, the Gopura sculptors receive a new coat of paint. So they are um, carved and embellishing um, every square inch of the temple, and they are also painted in great detail and bright colors as well. All right, the influence of Britain in India. So we're going to look at that tradition, how it influences the Indian art, understand the Western pictorial and spatial devices and how they are adapted by the Indian artists. So for instance, the train station, Victoria Terminus, named after Queen Victoria, this is in Mumbai, in you know, Bombay, Mumbai in India. It was designed by the architect Friedrich W. Stevens. Named after Queen Victoria of England is a monument to the colonial rule of England in India. The British brought with them the Industrial Revolution and they brought with them the railroad. So we want to know about the, you know, uh, British East India Company. We want to know um, that Trading Post was established there in the West, in India. And we want to know that Queen Elizabeth of England established a trading post in order to compete with the Dutch and the Portuguese. Um, they were attracted to India by the land spices and the gems and all those riches um, in the in the uh, East. So we see kind of this uh, Renaissance kind of high Gothic, early Renaissance influence there in uh, India at the train station. Okay, this uh, beautiful painting um, of the Maharaja Jaswat Singh of Marwar is painted in opaque watercolor, a very realistic portrait. And the artist um, really captures the realism of the center, but the artist also is using photography, a photographic reference, um, as a way to assist them in the painting. This was painted in 1880. Well, photography had arrived in India in 1840, and just that was just one year after its invention in Paris. So this new technology of uh, permanently asphyxing an image from the real world to a surface. Um, photography as we know it today, the chemical process photography, um, 
dark room photography. What, that technology was brought to India from Europe and of course changed the way that um, South and Southeast artists were painting their images. It changed the way that they thought of a portrait or what painting's role would be in making portraits um, now. So really fascinating. You can see the really soft chiaroscuro effect, the beard and the mustache, I mean, they're just so atmospherically painted. In fact, if you looked at it up close with a magnifying glass, you would see little bitty individual stippled dots of pigment there to actually make it look hazy and soft around the edges. Well, of course, India is not um, going to be under the rule of Britain for long. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, um, Mahatma Gandhi was the permanent leader of the Indian independence movement in British ruled India. He employed nonviolence um, and civil disobedience. Uh, Gandhi led India to independence and inspired movements for civil rights and freedom across the world. We also know that in South and Southeast Asia, there is the influence of Buddhism. And just a little refresher here, we know that Buddhists believe in samsara, the concept that individuals are born into endless births and rebirths. Along with that, the belief in karma, which is good or bad past actions, would determine then the future births and rebirths. The ultimate goal would be to escape the birth-rebirth cycle and become one with the forces of the universe through enlightenment known as nirvana. The Buddha advocated the path of asceticism with self-discipline and self-denial of earthly pleasures and possessions, thus ending the cycle of suffering. We remember that the Buddha was born a prince, Prince Siddhartha. He was born in this beautiful, lavish complex of castle, um, and he was, you know, given all the finest of everything and had not want for anything. And one day he left the palace and went out into the real world beyond the bubble of his um, you know, uh, uh, kingdom. And when he went out into the real world, he noticed that the world was filled with beautiful things, but also the world was filled with quite a bit of suffering for the average everyday person. And that was when he had his um, uh, understanding. He had, he had his uh, realization about the, no, the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. And he devoted his life to going around the world and preaching sermons related to Buddhism and um, trying to follow the Eightfold Path to Enlightenment. So his beliefs uh, with the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism uh, as the teacher of Buddhism is that life is suffering. That there is suffering within life. The cause of the suffering comes from desire. It's the human, the human condition. Humans are always wanting for things, and the, the pain of life comes from this desire. But you could overcome desire, and to overcome the desire, the, um, the, the uh, worshiper would follow the Buddhist Eightfold Path to Enlightenment or Nirvana. And this is represented through the Dharma wheel. The Dharma wheel showcases the states of nature or life. And we see that the Eightfold Path to Enlightenment is practicing the right view, the right aspiration, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. All right, so let's take a look uh, at how Buddhism influences Southeast Asia. We're going to be taking a look here at the Golden Age of Thai art. We're going to look at the architecture there in Burma and some of the South Asian and also the Chinese influences in the art of Vietnam. So here with the Golden Age of Thai art, this influence of the walking Buddhas in Thailand, they're very specific to Thailand. The body type suggests the supernatural being and expresses Buddha's beauty and perfection. Buddhism dominates much of Southeast Asia, but the walking Buddhas are really unique to Thailand. I know we had seen some examples of this uh, last class in the 
the 4 1200 uh, section of South and Southeast Asia. So the tradition continues. Um, the Buddha's body is soft and elastic, and we see the right arm hanging down um, very loosely as if it's almost like an elephant's trunk, while the other hand is held in the do not fear uh, mudra or the hand gesture, the mudras. Um, and again, just really lightweight, soft and elastic vibe going on. And then last but not least here, we have the Shwedagon Pagoda or the Golden Pagoda. This one is in Myanmar, Burma. Um, this pagoda, of course, is a shrine. Um, these are uh, Buddha shrines, like the stupa shrines we learned about last class. And of course, shrines house holy relics. And in this case with Buddhism, we're looking at the uh, relics of um, Buddha's uh, hair, individual pieces of the Buddha's hair. But the relics are spread all throughout um, South and Southeast Asia in various stupa shrines um, uh, dedicated um, you know, as holy places. And this particular pagoda is very well known because it is quite large at 344 feet tall it has gold, silver, and jewel encrusted surfaces. For instance, there's 13,153 gold plated sheets on its exterior, and the gold ball at the top of it is inlaid with 4,351 diamonds. So quite a lavish pagoda shrine indeed. Well, you all, that does bring us to the conclusion of the slideshow for today. I had a lot of fun with you all, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye-bye.